Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today, we're talking with Jeff Warner from the great state of Pennsylvania. Jeff is the current president of the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters. He's been involved in muzzleloading and and black powder shooting for for just about his whole life, but in the last few years has really gotten serious and and really got interested in the competitive side. And and when we talk about competition in this episode, uh, competition can kind of be an intimidating word, but it's really just a a catch-all term for target shooting. And, and being concerned about accuracy with your muzzleloader. And that's something that Jeff has really gotten into. And it, it's I think you're going to enjoy this episode if you're interested in getting a little bit more accuracy out of your muzzleloader or just want to know a little bit more about kind of the shooting sport side of muzzleloading. I'd like to thank Jeff again for coming onto the show. I really hope you enjoy this one, folks. I'm Jeff Warner. I am the uh, president of the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters. I think this will be my fourth year as president. Uh, I took over for... Uh, Frank Uber, who uh, did it for, uh, I think, probably a little longer than I did. Uh, but uh, he had some uh, big shooters to fill there, and uh, I think I'm doing an okay job. So how I got started in muzzleloading, um, uh, my dad was uh, really big into muzzleloading in the 80s. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, he passed away shortly before I was born, so I kind of inherited all of his stuff. In a weird way to say it, fortunately, I inherited a custom rifle of his. As a kid, I, I did a little bit of shooting, but I kind of was set away from the sport a little while. Uh, I got into my teenage years. I did some more shooting, uh, and then it was like my early 20s. I'd been uh, talking to my godfather, who is uh, Don Blazer, which uh, he's been pretty big in the sport for uh, basically his entire life. Yeah. Uh, and he kind of he told me, hey, you know what? Why don't you come out to the shoot this weekend? So uh, me and my wife, we uh, packed up what muzzleloading stuff we had and came out to the shoot. Uh, I believe that was at the Altoona Rifle and Pistol Club because uh, that's kind of close to where we live, and uh, it's kind of been downhill from there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, I just kept kept going to shoots, and then um, finally I kind of showed some initiative with the federation, and then someone nominated me to be in the board of directors, and then maybe a couple years after that, uh, I was the president. So uh, I've been shooting. I mean, I've been shooting black powder kind of my whole life. Yeah. Uh, but I've really only been seriously in the sport. I don't know, probably eight or ten years now. Well, that's plenty of time. I mean, you're you're real active and and real passionate about it. Uh, you know, that's the thing. You know, I'm I'm not necessarily like a I'm not a world renowned shooter by any means. Uh, I'm not a uh, well known uh, maker of rifles or accoutrements. Uh, though I aspire to be. I love making horns. I love making knives. Uh, truth be told, if I could if I could quit my job right now and blacksmith for a living, I would I would do it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know. Um, expensive hobbies and all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, but yeah, that's kind of how I got my start. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not like a, I'm not like a, I'm not going to be trying out for the Olympic shooting team anytime soon. Uh, but I, I really, really love, really love shooting, uh, especially black powder. So I'm very passionate about, um, firearms and I'm very passionate about history. So, uh, this sport kind of melds those two, those two together really well. Yeah. So, so would you say that's what, what keeps bringing you back to it is, is that melding of, you know, of shooting and, and history or is, is it something else that just keeps pulling you in? I mean, this sounds like it's one of your kind of the main things that you do. Uh, yeah, really. Well, you know, for the longest time, I, I mean, we have a lot of other hobbies too, you know, uh, we, we do other things. Um, but uh, especially most recently, I've been kind of trying to like really pick a lane and really lean into the, to, uh, to something and, and black powder is where it's at because, uh, um, I just, it's, there's something about, it's kind of hard to really put into words. Uh, I guess it's a multifaceted answer. Um, one of the biggest things is, is the people that you run into at the shoots. Uh, yeah. You know, they're, they're not, they're not a lot of shooting sports you can go to where, um, people are so welcoming, uh, and so outwardly willing to help you. Um, you know, I, I've been to shoots whenever I was still really new, you know, you, you don't really know what you're doing. So, I mean, I was very fortunate to have Don Blazer who has been shooting black powder for the, for the, uh, since the sixties, you know, so, I mean, he, he kind of taught me everything I know about muzzleloading, but, you know, I've been to a shoot where I've either run out of powder or run out of round ball, round balls, or my rifle was broken. You know, there's people that will offer you to use a spare rifle that they, that they have with them. Yeah. Uh, there's not, there's not many, um, shooting sports that you can go to and you have a malfunction where there's five or six people tripping over themselves to come and help you fix it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're a compet, you know, one of their competitors. Oh, for sure. And that's, that's kind of a crazy thing. Cause you know, you're competing against these people, uh, but they would sooner take the time out of their shoot 
to help you get back in the shoot rather than focus merely on winning. Yeah, it's something you don't see everywhere for sure. Oh, no, definitely not. I mean, don't get me wrong. There, you'll run into, I mean, everything you do in life, you'll run into those outliers where there's some uh, there's some nasty people here and there. But I'm telling you, in, in, in this culture, it's pretty few and far between. How would you describe competitive muzzleloading, uh, you know, for somebody that's interested in muzzleloading and maybe just hunts with them or is just kind of interested in historic arms and, and doesn't really know a whole lot about the, the competition side of things, what that's like? Well, um, believe it or not, there's probably more um, people around you that shoot competitive is almost a loose term as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know what? That scares a lot of people too. saying that, Oh, we go to a shoot ma- or a, um, a muzzleloader match. Like, Oh my goodness. You know, that sounds pretty serious. Uh, but you know, there, I mean, for instance, just the club that I belong to, um, we, we host the, uh, the interstate match, which we can talk about later here uh, in the spring. And that's a pretty serious target match, but we also hold woods walks where it's just kind of uh, a group of us that you shoot regularly together uh walk through the woods and 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 hit steel uh so you know you don't have to be some kind of a um master shooter to come to one of these shoots and compete well Mm -hmm. you know you you don't i mean again it kind of falls back on um everyone's willing to help each other uh you know it, it i can't kind of stress enough that if you're afraid to go to a shoot because you think you don't know enough uh that's not a worry that you should have because everyone is so forthcoming with trying to help uh, newcomers, especially uh, work their way through learning. Yeah. I find too, that there's uh, under that kind of, you know, that loose term of of competitive or competition muzzleloading, there's a lot of different things that you can, do with that because muzzleloaders are so versatile. So, I mean, one of my favorite things to do is, is a good woods walk where you just, you know, it's silhouettes out in the woods, you're kind of going through it with buddies and just kind of hanging out and having a good time, but you can get out and go for, on the, the precision side of things, you know, and, and try to just make a tight, as tight of a group as you can. You know, there's, there's different, you know, active matches like uh, out here, we have like some running boar matches that run at, at different ranges and things. I mean, there's, Every every shotgun oh. shooting sport you can do, you can do with a muzzleloader that a lot of people enjoy. Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. It's just, there's something for everybody. And there really is. And that's that's kind of the cool part is, you know, uh, to kind of someone who who doesn't really know any better, you'd think, oh, it's just a muzzleloader. You know, what what all can you do with it? But like you said, there, I mean, it, the, the possibilities are really endless. I mean, there's guys that have fancy inlines that are regularly shooting, you know, uh, a thousand plus yards with them. Uh, and then you go the whole way back to the guys that uh, are the living historians uh, that focus more on the history side. You know, and, and, and there's some shoots where you go and see both of those things. Like um, in the uh, in October, uh, now I say a lot about Altoona Rifle and Pistol Club. That's because they're kind of uh, within a close vicinity of me. Yeah. Uh, they, hold a, they hold a rifle frolic. Um, and you'll see guys like uh, Nate Kobuck goes there. You know, oh, so yeah. he, he is super serious about living history. Uh, and right next to him, you'll see a guy that kind of doesn't even care about the living history part of it. He's there to uh, just to, for the competitive shooting part. Uh, so so there are all of the different aspects of muzzleloading, uh, especially sh- the shooting part, have their own little niche. But oftentimes you'll see them melting together. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's kind of part of the fun too. And then, you know, that also helps you learn because, uh, you might get a guy that isn't so much interested in the living history part of it right now, but he goes to a shoot where there's a Nathan Kobuck there and now he's interested in doing that part. Yeah. And, and vice, and vice versa. You know, you know, I'm, I'm kind of one of the guys that's kind of in the middle. I love history and I love shooting. I and mean, I mean, chance start, I'll probably always be the shooter first. Cause uh, that's kind of uh, my focus. Uh, but especially recently, uh, I've been, I've been, <laughs> I probably kind of bugged the heck out of Nate Kobuck because I'm always messaging him <laughs> on, on ways to like, uh, as far as delving into the living history part, I got to kind of like, like I said, pick a lane and stick with it. Yeah. I don't know if I'll go as far as he can go time wise, but I want the primitive clothing that I'm wearing while I'm shooting to fit the part correctly. Yes. So like, I'm kind of like an interesting in between of, uh, you know, I mean, there is a line there. Some, some people only do living history some people only do shooting i kind of like to uh mix the two together a little yeah i'm I'm kind of the same way i I really enjoy 
trying to strike a balance with it. And there, there are weekends where I want to be, you know, really historical and there are weekends I just want to go out in my shorts and, and just shoot a muzzleloader, you know, not really worry about anything else. Absolutely. That was me this past weekend to state shoot Friday and Saturday. I was wearing my, uh, 18th century clothing. And then Sunday I was like, Nope, I need a pair of shoes on. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so n- neither of which helped me shoot at all. I, I did not shoot well. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, w- I was still happy to be there. And that's kind of the big thing too. Um, you know, I tell a lot of people that will ask me cause a lot of people will message the Facebook page asking, um, technical questions or asking about a club here or there. Yeah. And I'll say, Hey, you know, come out to the state shoot. And like, Oh my God, I'm not good enough to shoot at the state shoot. You know, well, um, for one, I like to tell people the only way to get better is, you know, and it's the same with basically anything. The only way to get better at something is to practice. Uh, and I know it sounds intimidating, but that's a great place to practice because I mean, we have tons of targets to shoot at the state shoot. Uh, we have targets and aggregates that are specific to newcomers. And really, I mean, if, if you're passionate about the sport or continuing muzzleloading, uh, you know, it's also great to just get out and support a local club. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and I, I basically did that, did that for years. Cause I mean, I mean, even right now, as far as shooting skill, I'm kind of like a middle of the road. Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm not great. I'm not awful. Like I think I'm number five on the state team. So for the longest time I shot, not only because I wanted to be better, but because I enjoyed the company and because I was passionate about the culture and I kind of wanted to give back a little. I think it's kind of a natural progression of it. You know, you can kind of, get into it and kind of find where you want to be. You get out and have some fun with it. And then you start to, you know, kind of want to see it continue and want to start being an active kind of steward of it almost. Absolutely. And, that, and that's kind of where I'm at right now as president of the Federation. Like I said, I'm, you know, if you, if you go down a, to a shoot somewhere or maybe a, uh, a show like a gun show or, uh, you know, you ask someone who Jeff Warner is, they're not going to tell you who I am because they don't know who I am. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just a regular guy yeah. uh, who's passionate about something. Uh, you know, the Federation's a small organization, um, but as someone who's passionate about the sport and the culture, I feel, and someone who is my age, and I'm only in my early 30s, uh, so as someone my age, I feel an innate responsibility to uh, progress the, uh, the culture and the sport. Uh, so as one person, you know, I figure if I can, if I can grow my organization, uh, that's my way I can give back and continue, uh, the tradition. Right. So that's kind of my goal, uh, with, with the presidency of the Federation is I kind of, you know, if I can grow my, my organization, you know, that's, that's, that's great. But if I can use that to also, uh, pass down the thing that I love, uh, that's kind of the ultimate goal there. Right. So it's, let's talk about the, the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters, because I didn't really know a whole lot about it. Um, really, you know, except for, you know, the last three to five years, I suppose, um, and just kind of getting more in tune with what the muzzleloading community was and is kind of nationwide. But it is an extremely active group out there. I mean, you guys have a ton of members across the state because muzzleloading is super popular out there in Pennsylvania. Oh, for sure. Uh, you know, we, uh, as an organization, we are actually, we, the, as the Pennsylvania Federation of Black Powder Shooters, we were founded in 1983. Prior to that, we were actually the Pennsylvania Federation of Muzzleloaders. Um, that name was uh, incorporated into a personal business. So in 1983, we kind of formed, formed our own organization. Uh, that was in Snyder County, Pennsylvania. Um, and really at that time, uh, you're talking in the in the mid 80s there. That's whenever there was a, you know, Don Blazer would tell me that they would shoot 37 weekends a year. Wow. Uh, so there's just tons of shooting happening. And what was happening was there was uh, a lot of shoots were happening on the same day. Mm. So a bunch of these guys got together and said, OK, we're we're losing uh, participation and we're kind of stepping on each other's toes. So let's try to put a calendar out. So they formed the Federation of Black Powder Shooters to put out a shoot calendar. And um, in the 80s, you know, there was no GPS or anything. So they had to put out maps to, so everyone could find these clubs. So that's whenever they got together and formed the organization. Uh, and or they had a, uh, um, the Federation uh, was basically just to put, the, uh, put, put all the shoots together. That way everyone was kind of uh, in a cohesive group there. Yeah. Uh, and, and then in 83, that was, uh, I think it was 83, 84 was the first state shoot. 
And we've been kind of going at it uh, ever since. It's kind of hard to think uh, now. I mean, a lot of people that are into muzzleloading really, you know, remember those days without GPS or anything. But I mean, so many muzzleloading clubs are are fairly small, you know, there might be up a, a holler somewhere on a little dirt road, you know, it can be a little difficult <laughs> to find, you know, so having the the thought to, you know, start putting out maps and, and dates on a calendar and things, I mean, that's something that a lot of clubs still struggle with today, you know, keeping that going. So I think it's great to see. Oh, for sure. And, uh, you know, we, we still base, I mean, I mean, right now our existence more so is to put on the state shoot every year um but we still put out a shoot book that is uh yearly uh that comes with membership uh as a member of the federation you get the shoot book we have uh there's 30 charter clubs in there uh, and in each charter club has a page in the shoot book that uh, lists their shoot dates and obviously the location and the uh contact information for the, mm-hmm. uh, for that particular club uh so uh that's you know that's kind of the uh justification for membership is uh not only does membership cover your entry fee into the state shoot but that gets you your shoot book and a uh, quarterly newsletter and, and membership cheap. It's like, uh, it's 15 bucks for single membership and then uh, $20 for a family membership, which is you, your uh, spouse and any children under the age of 18. So how many muzzleloading shoots or, or small events at these clubs do you say go on throughout the year? Is it something almost every weekend or is it oh spaced goodness, out a yes. little bit more? Um, so the very first couple pages of the shoot book, uh is a count just a calendar it's basically just listing the days in the month okay uh and and each month is you know it's like two or three pages of calendar <laughs> uh, you you could you could probably shoot uh almost every weekend of the month if you wanted in in some in some uh way uh throughout the state that's something uh, so and you know there's multiple multiple of these clubs have rendezvous and and there's different different clubs with different things like a lot of these clubs uh they only do woods walks uh some only punch paper some do some do both uh a couple of our our charter clubs really they're in the book because they have one big event each year um <clears throat> jacobsburg historical society is in, in is in our club or in our is one of our charter clubs and uh they don't necessarily hold a bunch of shoots, but they have um, a big market fair and rendezvous mm-hmm. in October. So we like to advertise that. Yeah. Uh, so. so we've talked about this, the state shoots a little bit. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? And like, what's the difference between one of these state shoots and uh, you know, the, the other kind of club weekend events that we've been talking about? So, you know, your general, your, your general shoot you go to in the weekend to a club, um, I can't speak for all the clubs. Most of the ones around here, you're typically shooting for um, meat as a prize. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just kind of, you go to the shoot, you shoot, you win, or you don't win. Uh, right. You win prize <laughs> and you go home. Uh, uh, the, the state shoot, uh, we have multiple, you know, the three big ags we do are the, uh, the state champion, which is anyone can shoot in it. Uh, the ladies ag, which is lady specific and the marksman ag, which is uh, specific to people who have, uh, who are pretty much new and the the way that the marksman ag works is if if you've won the marksman ag before you can no longer compete in it mm. uh so so this is uh this is kind of i mean i kind of downplayed it by saying you know it it's not uh intimidating because it really it shouldn't be uh but but you know there we do get some serious shooters that come uh you know this is where the uh the best shooters in the state come to congregate and shoot in one uh all in one competition. Right. Uh, so, so when you're, when you're talking about an aggregate here, I get a lot of questions about muzzleloading competitions and how they're made up and, and aggregates are, are one of the things that come up quite a bit. So can you right. talk a little bit about these aggregates and, and what makes up an aggregate that you're shooting at this kind of match? Right. So an aggregate, it's pretty simple. So an aggregate is a um, combination of multiple targets where whenever you're done shooting your target, they take uh, the scores from, say, if you have two targets in an aggregate, uh, they would take both the scores from those targets and add them together. That's your aggregate score. Um, a lot of times an aggregate is not re-enterable, uh, but that's not necessarily so for every aggregate. Hmm. Uh, so basically it's a sum total of the number of targets that you shoot in that aggregate. Uh, whereas so if you're shooting for just a, 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 um, a singular target, 
they just take the score from that target and and um, place or prize on that single single target. And how many aggregates or how many how many targets that make up an aggregate at like the state shoot for the state championship? Well, so a couple of different ones. So like the uh, the open ag, which is sometimes people refer to it as the men's ag, but it is the open. Anyone can shoot in it. There's four targets in that. There is a 25 yard. Uh, two 50 yard targets and a 100 yard target. Um, but then we had the Friday, the Friday only. Yeah. I really struggled at a hundred this weekend. Um, but then we had the Friday, Friday only target, which or uh, aggregate, which was only two targets, one at 25 and one at 50. So really a lot of times, um, it's, again, it's kind of a loose term. Um, it's kind of up to the, uh, the planner's discretion, how many targets can be in an aggregate. Uh, as far as we do it, uh, maybe there may be more official rules. I'm not sure uh, how the NMLRA uh, lists it, um, which I have the range book right here. I could look. <laughs> that's okay. That, that's kind. Of, that's kind. Of, <laughs> that's kind of how we. Uh, that's kind of how we do it. We kind of plan. Uh, usually in June we get together. I think June or July we get to. No, sorry, June. Uh, and we have what we call a target party where we get together and. Uh, get all the targets put together and that way we have enough time if we need to order any uh and then we kind of set out the matches we kind of go off of every year we go off of basically the same uh match program uh, i like to sprinkle in some new stuff every once in a while like last year was the first year for the friday only ag um you, obviously that that was pretty self-explanatory you had to shoot on friday right uh, and that was the only so i kind of made made that ag do uh kind of garner some more interest in being there the full three days uh next year i believe we're, we're going to do a um, i'd like to do a primitive ag where you have to at least put forth some kind of effort to show me that you're dressed primitive uh, and we'll probably have some requirements on the rifle that you shoot yeah i think it's good to kind of spice things up like that a little bit now and then yeah you got to change it up a little you know otherwise it gets kind of stagnant and i'm also kind of um you know we've been kind of doing things the same for a long time I'm not that there's anything wrong with how we were doing it, uh, but like I said, it, it, things kind of get uh, not boring, but stagnant over time. So it's kind of nice to change it up. Yeah. So you, you said you didn't do well uh, this year, but could you kind of walk us through what it was like preparing for and then and then going to the state shoot this year as a as a competitor, not necessarily you know one of the people running the event, but kind of what what's right. your your planning process as you head into something like this? Uh, well, um, I can use the uh, the um, interstate match really. I can kind of relate to that more. Uh, as far because I don't really take as much time planning that part of it. Um, but anyhow, um, really the big thing is, and I kind of dropped the ball a little bit this year. Uh, luckily, my wife had changed the size of round ball she was using, uh, but I was supposed to mold a bunch of round balls. Uh, typically, I would have a jar full of round balls ready to go. Um, I have a bunch of cleaning patches cut up, uh, and I'd make sure I had enough uh, patch material. Uh, luckily, I had a couple pounds of powder laying uh, I think I had bought uh, over the summer. Uh, otherwise, I'd have to uh, get that. Um, you know, typically, it depends on how much shooting you're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my wife and I both probably burnt probably about a pound of powder over the weekend. Oof. Uh, and there were some some guys shot more than we did. Uh, so, uh, and, and, you know, that depends a lot on how much you're, how much, you know, your load that you're shooting. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, you expect to shoot a pound of powder. Um, you know, it's smart to bring more <laughs> in case. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then, uh, you know, 3F, we obviously, we burn 3F a lot more than we burn 4F. So I keep a pound of 4F in my shooting box. And uh, that usually lasts me about a year. Maybe. <laughs> Depending. It, it was a slow summer. I didn't, I didn't do a ton of shooting this summer. That's why I didn't shoot very good this weekend uh but so uh basically just just your normal stuff you want to bring um we allow spotting scopes uh so i like to tell people that muzzle loading is a stuff heavy sport yeah uh <laughs> you know we we show up you know i have a shooting box uh, my wife samantha has a shooting box and then we have a um, trapper's basket it's not usually packed full to the top but it has our spotting scope and extra patch material and uh, if I have to, you know, if I need my shooting bag or my horn, it's in there and my tomahawk. Uh, so, you know, there, uh, 
you know, muzzle load. As, as far as shooting sports go, muzzle loading, uh, I think, requires uh, a lot more stuff. Yeah, especially if you're going out and planning on burning through a pound of powder. I mean, that's a lot of shooting. And that's, oh, uh, yeah. I mean, if you're just going out to, you know, to shoot 10 or 20 shots, that's one thing. But when you start going through a pound, I mean, that, you can have a whole lot of things happen there that you need to prepare for and be ready for. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, cleaning. Cleaning is a big deal. Yeah. Um, and again, that depends on, you know, the way you clean also depends on the way you load as well. Uh, you know, that uh, several variables go into that. So how do you clean then? Uh, well, Currently, I clean, so we make our own cleaning solvent. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as moose milk. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, all it is is it's water, uh, water-soluble oil, uh, which you can get. It's I don't know if you know anybody that works in a machine shop. or uh, you can, I think you can buy it at Napa or most auto parts store, but it's oil that mixes with water. And then floor soap. Uh, I like to use Lest oil. Uh, some people use Murphy's. Uh, Simple Green works fine. Um, but, uh, I like to, uh, I don't, I run a uh, non-coated patch, so I, I lubricate the patch with it before I push the ball over it. Oh, okay. And then a after every five shots, uh, I run probably one or two cleaning patches with it. Hmm. Uh, I like to tell people that if you ask, uh, a hundred guys how they clean their muzzleloader, uh, probably 89 of them are going to tell you something different and each one of those guys is going to say that that's the absolute best way to do it yep <laughs> uh, uh really the, i mean the best I, advice i can give is any cleaning that you do to your rifle is better than not cleaning at all yeah uh, you know, we all know know that guy that loads his rifle in rifle season and shoots it five or six deer with it and then loads it again and it stays loaded unclean till the next hunting season <laughs> you know so uh we like to uh, take a little better care of our our guns than that. So, what, can you give us a little bit of a an explainer of the of the muzzleloaders that you compete with? I mean, we're kind of talking heavily about rifle here. You know, what what's your rifle like, and and are you competing with or shooting any other kinds of muzzleloaders? Uh, yeah. So I can start out with the second part of that real quick. Yeah. I I don't have uh, I only have rifles. Um. But we do like this for their instance, the state shoot, we have a smooth bore ag and we also have a pistol ag. Okay. So, uh, and we also have actually, we have an ag <clears throat> in the, uh, in the state shoot, it's called the any black powder ag where, uh, you could bring an inline if you wanted. It's not typical that we see people bring in lines, um, but the option is there if you'd want to bring it. Um, uh, but I mean, specifically my rifle, it is, uh, I prefer a late Lancaster stock. Uh, it kind of fits in my shoulder a little better. Uh, I'm running a custom gun that's built by uh, my godfather, Don Blazer. Uh, it has a um, the 40 caliber, it's a 7 8 40 caliber uh, FCI Burton barrel. Mm -hmm. uh, left hand, it's, I'm left handed, so uh, I stand on the wrong side. <laughs> uh, uh, it has a, a large siler lock that's been uh, hot rodded a little. Ooh. I'm on a good buddy, Greg Smyers. Uh, it has uh, bronze bushings. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the bushing around the uh, the tumbler is bronze, and uh, every, uh, there's some spring work done to it, and uh, basically everything's really, really polished. And that's made a huge difference for me uh, <clears throat> as far as uh, accuracy goes. Uh, but, I mean, it, really, you don't have to have some fancy custom-made multi-thousand-dollar rifle. Um, one of the best shooters that I know, uh, Justin Burke, he is, uh, he's won the Ohio offhand championship. He's won the Pennsylvania offhand championship and he may have won the pencil or the West Virginia offhand championship. Uh, his rifle is probably my favorite rifle on the line. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's also probably one of the ugliest rifles on the line. <laughs> uh, and I've, I told him I was going to say this, uh, uh, so don't think I'm insulting him cause he knows. Um, but basically, uh, this rifle is the epitome of, uh, function over form. Uh, he just, it's a plain old stock, no butt plate. There's not been an ounce of finish put on this gun, uh, which it's about black now. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, but it has a, he, he's running a rice barrel. Um, uh, the, the trigger guard is just a piece of copper pipe that he's hammered flat and kind of bent around to look like a trigger guard. And I'm pretty sure it's electrical tape to the gun. Oh my gosh. Uh, but, but the ramrod pipes are electrical tape to the gun. Uh, but anyhow, um, 
it's a, a 40 caliber rice barrel. Uh, I think he's running a decent set of Davis triggers. Uh, and he's running a large Siler lock. No, I mean, uh, the lock has been hot rotted by Jeff T Bay. Uh, okay. so it's probably, uh, it probably more money into that than the whole gun, but then he wasn't running that originally. So, uh, I mean, it, it, he is the perfect example that you do not have to have, uh, some fancy, uh, custom made rifle to go out and compete really, really well. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we just, there is a guy on the line this weekend. He was shooting, I think it was a Thompson center percussion gun, uh, factory barrel and everything. And he was running, um, triple seven out of it. And he was doing really well with it. Really? So, That's awesome. You know, uh, yeah. That's something I've heard over the years, and I've seen it myself. If there is a gun that shows up on the line that's electrical taped together, you just it's it's going to be dangerous. I mean, it's just going to be tearing through targets. I mean, it's going to look <laughs> like a mess, but it's just gonna it's just gonna go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like I said, you know, you you kind of you look at that and you're like, oh my god, that thing has a piece of copper pipe as their trigger guard. But you know what I mean? What what's it? What does that actually do to help you shoot? Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and he practices is the big thing is uh, he practices. Um, that's one thing that's kind of helped me. Like I, I'd say I shot bad. I shot okay this weekend. I didn't place anywhere. Um, but any practice is better than no practice. Like, uh, you know, this has been a slow, slow summer as far as me getting out and shooting. And, and powder availability has kind of lent, lent itself to that a little. Mm -hmm. um, but uh I put a wood, I just could kind of whittle out a little um, flint shaped piece of wood and I kind of clamp that in the jaws of the lock and uh, I have a little orange sticker on my wall in the living room. If I'm watching TV or if I'm kind of walking through the living room, I have the gun leaning there and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll get a couple uh, dry fire shots through, through at the wall, you know, here and there, try to get maybe five or 10 a day or something. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe if I'm really not doing anything, maybe I'll get more than that. Uh, but, but anything you can do like that uh, really makes a big difference. Hmm. I hear that a lot. It's something I haven't, I haven't done a whole lot of dry firing with my flintlock. I think, um, I've talked about it before, but I like to try to practice with an air rifle in the evening. I've got a little right. 25 yard line off my back porch. I can go out yeah. and, you know, if I can get in 10 shots a few times a week, I feel pretty good. But if I don't, it's, uh, I've got hell to pay if I get on paper again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, air rifle is great because, uh, you know, you kind of get, it requires the same sort of follow through as shooting a flintlock does because of the, uh, you know, there's obviously a, de a delay there compared to, you know, a center fire rifle. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, any, any sort of practice, man, you know, uh, that, that really makes a difference. So like, it's not that I, I didn't shoot worse than I have been. Uh, I've at least sustained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I like last year, like that marks when I, I, may have been able to place in that but i won that last year so i can't i won't be able to shoot in that again right uh, yeah you've bumped up and really class. At, at, right sort of uh as as president i kind of that was whenever i took over the presidency i kind of that was the agreement like hey i'll be the president as long as i still get to shoot right uh you know uh, a lot of guys that would take over that position would kind of like okay i can't i gotta concentrate on this you know uh luckily i have a really good team of people together uh, and honestly, luckily, I mean, I have my wife is very supportive of my of my hobby. She's on the board of directors. Uh, she shoots. Uh, she won the uh, ladies championship, or the, yeah, she's the ladies champion for Pennsylvania for 2022. So, uh, wow, congratulations! Very fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I can't brag about myself, so at least I have uh, I've heard to brag about. So. Well, she makes you look good, though. Uh, you know, you can't argue about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, and she's shooting a rifle that I built. So, oh, really? That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, well, I was under the very watchful eye of uh, Don Blazer, so uh, uh, he'll keep you out of trouble. Not a, a pro. Well, yeah. <laughs> so what what kind of um, rifle is it? Give us some details. Uh, well, it's a uh, it's kind of an abnormality or abnormality, really. Uh, she's running a uh, it's a three quarter forty caliber rice barrel. Uh, we had to have rice make it for us because uh, usually you don't find a um, thirty six inch long three quarter inch barrel. Yeah. Um, you know, not very often anyway, in 40 caliber, especially, uh, and it's kind of also a late Lancaster. It's very contemporary. Uh, it's mounted in, um, German silver. Uh, 
I attempted some engraving on it, and I'm telling you, uh, there's not much engraving on it. Because, uh, <laughs> I really the, the best engraving I did on the rifle was sign sign the top barrel flat. Hey, that's and the that's one that counts. I, that's right, uh, but that's the one I practiced my name a little. So, uh, but uh, that's kind of another cool thing about uh, muzzle loading as a, especially a competitive shooting sport. You know, I if you have the ambition, you know, you can go to a shoot and win something with not only a gun that you built, uh, but round balls that you molded, uh, you know, patching that you cut up yourself, uh, maybe a bag that you made or a horn that you made, uh, you know, so, I mean, it, uh, you know, not a lot of other shooting sports can you say, Hey, I won this match with the gun that I built in my house. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, I think that's a very unique aspect of the, uh, the entire thing. Uh, everything you can just make everything <laughs> yeah uh, and that's kind of that's kind of a nice part of it too is uh you know up up front cost of some things uh can be expensive uh but after you have you know i mean obviously the gun's going to be your most expensive thing but i mean just to get out on the range if you're savvy with with some craftsmanship uh you know it, it's it's relatively dare I say cheap to go shooting the muzzle loader. Uh, you know, I just shot all weekend. Uh, I don't know how many shots, probably 80 or a hundred shots or more. I, I don't know, probably more than that. Uh, and it was far cheaper than if I would have taken one of my ARs out and shot all weekend with it. Yeah. You can burn through a <laughs> hundred shots pretty quick. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and for probably twice the price, you know, I mean, now again, you know, I'm, I cast my own round balls, yeah. know, but the lead pot costs something. But, you know, like I said, after your upfront cost, the stuff ends up paying for itself. Uh, and really just to have the, the bare essentials to go shooting. I mean, you really, it's really not that bad. Yeah. Uh, and when you compare it to, you know, we're not shooting 15 or $1,800 and one Durand's, uh, you know, you, you can certainly, like I said, there's a guy out on the line this weekend competing well with a, with a factory made gun that probably cost him four or five hundred dollars. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I mean, we you know we don't get into shooting sports uh, to save money. <laughs> right. You know, it, uh, it's uh, you know it's going to be an expense going into it, and I think the the neat part of it, like you said, with muzzleloading, is you can get so involved with so much of your equipment. I mean, you can go down to to making everything that you're taking to the range that weekend or that day or whatever if you want to or or you don't have to but you can you can really even at a base level if you're purchasing these things you can personalize it to something that you want and and you want to carry you don't have to, you can go to the line and know that all of your stuff is yours and nobody else has something like it which is kind of neat absolutely absolutely and and the other things you know even stuff you didn't make you know there's kind of a big difference between something that's factory made because you know look most of the stuff we use muzzle loading can't be factory made or if it is you would certainly tell a big difference uh and that's kind of another thing that draws me in to just even the um the stuff that comes with muzzle loading is everything that you have whether that be a horn or a bag or a rifle most of the time that's a handmade item yes uh you know so you get that air of quality that you don't get uh, from from something like a uh, you know something modern. You know, don't get me wrong. I love my modern rifles. I have a small collection of ARs and, and other such things like that. But I mean, if 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 I were to walk into my my uh, my gun room, uh, nine chances out of ten, the gun that I pick up is at least going to have a wood stock on it. Yeah. And most of the time, it's going to be one of my front locks. Yeah, there's just such a beauty about them, man. You just can't you can't beat it with with the modern stuff. No, you you can't. Uh, and and it it kind of adds to the collectability too. You know, especially because like um, uh, almost everyone I know, in some capacity, at least anyone that I know that shoots black powder, makes something other, whether that be knives or powder measures or bags or horns. Uh, so it's kind of like a cool thing where like. Uh, I want to have the things that my friends make, you know, <laughs> like, a, yes, uh, I have a small collection. My wife and I have a small collection of leather goods, uh, from, uh, 
an older fellow that we shoot with down in Kentucky that goes to Kentucky with us. Uh, his name is uh, Les Davidson. We, we kind of like to collect his stuff, uh, you know, so uh, that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, you know, we all kind of trade amongst ourselves uh, to have each other's stuff that we've made. Yeah. And you kind of, when you put that up in your gun room or in your hallway or, or however you display it, you know, you, every time you go by that, you, you think about the friends that you've made and that you go out and shoot with and have fun with. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and that kind of circles right back into the people. Yeah. Uh, you just, the, the people really are what, that's kind of what stapled me into continue going back. Uh, it just the company that, that you keep while you're at a shoot. Yeah, I think it's it's one thing to, you know, I, I enjoy being at home and, and practicing and, and, and shooting and things, but going out to an event and, and, and shooting is fun, but then all the times in between the shots are are great. You know, you're, you're catching up with people you may have not seen for a while, or you're just out having a good time, you know, you're just enjoying some American traditions, really, with like-minded individuals. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and if you're anything like us, we're all, uh, we're kind of constantly digging each other too. We're kind of, uh, Oh yeah. That's a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're rough on each other, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's like a friendship and a com camaraderie there that, uh, keeps you on your toes. I'll say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> you know, if you, if, if I take a new buddy to, to arrange or a match or something and, uh, you know, I'll get a comment about how kind of rough the crowd is, but you know, it, it's, it's not really a, a malicious sense. I mean, I'll get some nasty comments where, where guys are trying to be malicious, you know, or just be jerks online or something. But at an event, if I'm getting razzed for how I'm shooting or how I'm doing, I know that the, the people giving that to me, you know, they really care about me and, and what I'm doing and my family and things, but that's just kind of part of the sport. You know, you, you're, it's slow, so you have a little time in between there to, to pick on each other. <laughs> yeah, and that's it. And that's all it is. It's it's a, a kind of one of the things where uh, if they didn't pick on you and goof around with you, you'd kind of wonder if they had an issue with you or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, but we're, we're constantly, uh, I mean, you know, just as much as we like to dig at each other, you know, we're helping each other just as much. Yes. Uh, so that, it, that, that just kind of adds to the... Uh, adds to the atmosphere really yeah and it feels good when somebody's razzing you and then you you go and you know drop a few in the x or the 10 ring you know that's that's always a nice <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, kind of a good a good way to come back a little bit yeah there. yeah or if they shoot a, if they shoot a miss of some kind or something yeah like that. This podcast is brought to you by Thor Bullets. Thor Bullets are a premium full-bore muzzleloader bullet designed specifically for modern inline rifles. Thor Bullets do not require plastic sabos or belts to be fired, meaning less cleaning for you between shots. The patented copper base creates an airtight seal, giving you greater distance and accuracy. Thor's unique engineering allows the bullets to retain 95% of their weight upon impact, and the controlled expansion ensures large, easy-to-follow blood trails. Thor bullets are currently available in a 50 caliber version that is sized to your specific bore. Thor is also expanding into a new 45 caliber bullet designed for faster 1 in 24 and 1 in 22 twist inline rifles. For more information on these great bullets, visit www.thorbullets.com. We'd like to thank Thor Bullets for their sponsorship of this podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Muzzleloader Magazine, the publication for traditional black powder shooters. Since 1974, Muzzleloader has been the leading magazine devoted to traditional black powder hunting and shooting. Each issue is jam-packed with articles on hunting, shooting, gunsmithing, do-it-yourself projects, living history, American history, book and product reviews, and much, much more. Muzzleloader Magazine is the best traditional muzzleloading magazine, bar none. I'd like to thank Jason at Muzzleloader Magazine for his continued support of I Love Muzzleloading and the I Love Muzzleloading podcast. I don't care what you're into. If you're interested in muzzleloading, this is the kind of magazine I think you need to check out. I've been a fan of Muzzleloader Magazine even before the sponsorship. Uh, I've always been impressed with what Jason has been able to put out with Muzzleloader Magazine, and it really means a lot for him uh, to be supporting I Love Muzzleloading and our efforts over here. Thank you, Muzzleloader Magazine, for your support. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the interstate shoot that you've been talking about a little bit here. It's one of the things that I really love that is still going on um, in muzzleloading is is the kind of rivalry between Pennsylvania and Kentucky. What what do you think about that? Uh, well, um, 
we we get down to Kentucky, I and mean, it's kind of I want. I think this will be my third or fourth year going to Kentucky now. Uh, the Kentuckians come up to us in the uh, the springtime, and uh, we go down in the fall, the first weekend of October. Um, that started happening in 1963. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know. There's always been the big argument whether it's the Pennsylvania rifle or the Kentucky rifle. Uh, so in 1963, uh, Governor Scranton of Pennsylvania. Uh, challenged Governor Combs of um, Kentucky to a shootout for the claim to the name. And a couple guys from Pennsylvania rode horses the whole way to Kentucky and uh, handed him the challenge. And then we uh, promptly uh, lost the first two years. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, so they, they shot for two years and then they didn't shoot that match again in 1981. uh, And then, (laughs) They did it from 81 on, and uh, Pennsylvania didn't win their first match till 1989. Uh, so, so you stuck with it, for, we'll say. <laughs> for, we, yeah, so for the first solid, you know, 20 years there, it was the Kentucky rifle. Uh, now, I'm I'm, I'm biased. Uh, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania, so uh, I, I, no matter what, believe it is the uh, the uh, Pennsylvania rifle, which I'm sure I'll uh, catch some stuff over that. But, uh, um. Last to cut last year, I know last year we won, and I think the year before that we may have won, uh, but last year we won pretty good. Um, but it's, I'll tell you, uh, you know, we see those guys twice a year, and we love to give each other uh, heck about stuff, uh, but we really love shooting with those guys down there. Uh, yeah, it's probably I look forward to going to Kentucky all year long. Uh, it's really, I mean, we ended up driving the whole way to Kentucky, which it ends up being like nine hours. We stop and screw around at Cabela's in West Virginia for a little while, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> you know, we we drive that whole way to essentially shoot twenty shots. Yeah. Um, we we do some other shooting the day before the big shoot. Um, but we really really love going down there, and we really love seeing those guys. Uh, we really look forward to whenever they come up and shoot with us in the spring. What kind of targets are you shooting in that match? Uh, that match was only four targets, so um. You shoot a small bull at 25 and a big bull at 25, and then you shoot the uh, the same targets at 50. Not the same exact targets, but the same type of target at 50. Right. Uh, so five shots per target, so you're trying to get 200 points. Um, but uh, and that, I don't know that I've ever heard of anyone shooting a perfect score, but uh, pretty pretty close. Uh, those guys those guys down in Kentucky can shoot. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they, uh, they give us a run for our money. Huh. Uh, and that's all offhand the, rifle. Oh yeah, all offhand, all offhand yep. rifle it has to be has to be a flintlock. And for that shoot specifically, uh, you have to load uh, from the bag, which you're allowed to use a shooting stand. Um, and you have to be uh, dressed primitive. Uh, they're pretty relaxed with the uh, the the rules as far as what you're wearing. Uh, they just want you to make like a solid effort. Uh, so some guys are. Uh, have their gears a little more uh, historically correct, I guess I'd say, than others. Yeah. Um, but but it's mostly a primitive shoot. Hmm. Uh, and and we typically try to put ten man teams together. So, uh, and, you know, originally it wasn't just Pennsylvania and Kentucky. Uh, you know, in the '80s you had guys from you had ten man teams from Virginia, West Virginia, New Jersey, Maryland, Ohio, uh, Indiana. Yeah, my my uh, one grandfather was on the Indiana team for a few years. Now, most I mean, we get some other guys that come from other states, but it's mostly just Pennsylvania and Kentucky. We try to put ten man teams together. Organization that this is the state team is the Pennsylvania Company of Riflemen, uh, and they're also a charter club of the federation. Okay. Um, and the the team that we shoot against down there is the uh, Kentucky's Corps of Long Riflemen. Uh, their qualification process is a little more stringent than ours. Um, for us, there's uh, a couple of different shoots that you have to shoot qualifiers at throughout the year in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, one of them, you can, you can shoot a qualifier to state shoot. Uh, there's, uh, and if you go to Kentucky, that score you shoot in Kentucky counts as one of your qualifiers as for the following year. Okay. Uh, we try to, we try to put 10 man teams together. Uh, there was a couple of years they shot five man teams because of, uh, you know, there wasn't that enough people participating. Um, but then anyone else who doesn't qualify for the first team will go down. And if they go to Kentucky, they will shoot on the second team. Mm. Uh, and, and if there's not enough outliers uh, to put two 10 man second teams, they kind of put one team together and that's the running aid team. I just love that. I, lo- I love that there's, you know, just some, it, there's a rivalry there, but it's, it's all in good fun. You know, you're going and catching up with friends and 
and just it, it really is. Yeah, and uh, that's something that um, you know, I'm I'm very lucky that uh, uh, one of my very close family friends, uh, Nathan Brown, is the captain of the uh, state flintlock team here in Pennsylvania, and uh, so I get to learn a lot from him. Uh, and um, so I'm I'm really trying to uh, kind of get notoriety for not only the federation but but something kind of a big deal with, you know with the with the state team. Uh, I think that could be something that could uh, you know hold a lot of interest for a lot of people that may not realize that it's even a thing. Yeah, that's what that's what struck me about it. And every time I've talked to people about it or mentioned it, I've gotten a, a lot of questions about it because it just seems like the kind of thing that you wouldn't expect in muzzleloading. I mean, you have, you know, your kind of big national events, but um, kind of a, I mean, it, it's it's not informal, but it's not super formal, I guess. You know, the, this right. interstate shoot is just kind of a neat thing. It's a, a carryover from, uh, you know, the '60s. There, I just think it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're doing what we can do, uh, to keep it going. I mean, we've consistently put, uh, you know, 10 man teams together. Uh, this will be my first year actually making the team, the first team just on, on skill. Nice. Congratulations. Uh, I've, I've, I've been on, I've been on the first team. Well, thank you. I've been on the first team, uh, and I think two, uh, one, one other year at least. Uh, but that was, I was like the first alternate, uh, and someone didn't show up or something, so I made the team. But uh, this, the, my goal this year was to hold an average of uh, uh, like uh, in the mid 170s, and I'm like one right at 174 average. So nice. Yeah. That's no small feat, man. <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of practice. You know, like I said, I'm I'm kind of like at a middle of the pack where I'm at right now, uh, and you know, I've worked for it. So uh, yeah, that pays off. Yeah, it does. You know, the, the, that little bit of, like I said, that, that little bit of dry firing and that lock work that I had done, uh, it's really made a big difference. Would you say that, you know, lock work like that is, is really important if you're really going to focus on, on competition muzzleloading? Or do you think you can get over uh, that with, with practice and just, you know, sheer skill going after it? Um, you know, anything that you can do to your rifle uh, is going to help you in the long run. Um, but, you know, a lot of people sometimes think that you can just throw a bunch of money at something and you're just going to be good at it. Um, if you don't have the basic fundamentals and mechanics down, it doesn't matter how fancy or how expensive or how much work you have done to something, uh, you're, you're not going to be good at it. Yeah. It, it's certainly going to help, you know, but to be really good at something, you really just need to practice. Uh, you know, there's those guys, those guys that went down to Kentucky that first year, 1963, a lot of those guys were shooting original rifles from, you know, the early 1800s. Yeah. That's what they uh, had. They were, that's what, that was what was available, you know? Uh, so, and those guys were really good. Uh, and for, for people that are listening that may have never had the opportunity to at least run the triggers or run the lock on an original rifle. Uh, a lot of times <laughs> they are not good. We are very uh, blessed you know. with modern uh, machining practices today. <laughs> Absolutely. So, uh, you know, like I said, you, you can spend a lot of money on fancy uh, work done to your gun, uh, but ultimately that's, that's a personal preference. Uh, without the, without the, the, the know-how and the practice and the proper mechanics, you know, uh, and that's that right there. That's solved by just going out and doing it. Yeah. Uh, you you got to go out and shoot. For me, I think it, it's something as simple as, as knowing where your shot broke is just a, a, to me, that's kind of a marker of, you know, getting enough shooting in it. And that's kind of a, a threshold you can pass to, to start to know that you're getting somewhere. If you can call that shot after you shot based on how it broke and where it, where you parked it basically, um, you know, that's kind of a step, I think, in that direction to knowing where you're going and you're kind of thinking Absolutely. about it then and you're in that mindset rather than just waiting to get the trigger pulled. Oh, for sure. That, that was kind of, and you know what, you kind of hit the nail right in the head there. That was kind of the turning point for me whenever I kind of knew that I was getting better was I was starting to be able to, call, even my bad, especially my bad shots, Oh yeah. call where they're going to be at. Uh, you know, a lot of times whenever you're nailing the 10 ring or, you know, even the nine ring, you're like, man, I don't know where that could have went, but it felt really good. 
you know, you know that it's going to be somewhere where you want it to be. Yeah. Uh, but whenever you can get enough experience in and kind of know what you're doing wrong when you do something wrong, that really kind of shows you that you're kind of headed in the right direction. Uh, and, and that's also a point too, like whenever you're coming up skill wise, when you can kind of figure out what you're doing wrong, that's also kind of a point where you're going to like, all right, I'm really frustrated with this. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I had to overcome, uh, you know, there was a long, probably, I don't know, the first two or three years for me, uh, you know, I just, I just couldn't get it together. You know, the, uh, it was struggle for me to keep the shots on the paper. Uh, you know, I would hold a group there. Then it got to the point where I would hold a group, probably two inch group high left all day long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no matter where I, no matter where I would screw my sights or move my powder or, is because I fig finally figured out I was pulling out of the gun. Yeah. So the stock was following my face. Uh, and that's where, that's where I was landing my shots. So, uh, that, that is whenever I figured out, okay, I just need to shoot it. I'm basically flinching out of the gun. Yep. So I figured out, I just needed to shoot that flinch out. And, uh, and, you know, finally, finally I worked it out. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it stinks because it, it comes down to, you know, spending the money on the powder and the balls and the, and the equipment. But I mean, you got to get a few thousand rounds down range if you know you're wanting to get to that point where you're you know nines tens and x's on a lot of that oh, stuff sure. and, and that's not to say that's what you have to do you know oh, no, if no. you're wanting to go down that road that's how you need to start thinking about a lot of this stuff is you gotta you gotta start shoot you don't you, you want to shoot and think about it but you don't want to overthink it you know you just like with, you know, just shooting a, a group high and left there, you can think about that all day long and just keep putting them up there because you're so worried about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. And, and, and a lot of times, uh, you know, I've found that, and you know what, uh, Samantha will yell at me every time. Uh, I'll be struggling <laughs> with a target or something, and she's like, you know what, you just need to take a break. Yeah. Uh, because you kind of get to the point where if you're, if you're getting frustrated and angry with it, you know, don't quit. But maybe wait a relay or two. Yes. Uh, before you post another target or uh, or 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 you know shoot more on that target. Now you know you can't really do that at, at nationals because you have to get your target done by the end of the relay. Uh, we the federation doesn't hold that role. You can have a target posted all day if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, I think it's yeah, a lot once, more once relaxed. You, right. For sure. Um, but if you, if you're getting frustrated with it, a lot of times the best thing you can do is uh you know, just kind of take a break uh and that's like <laughs> another thing too that i've learned and this weekend i did really good with it especially to 100 is uh when you're up on the line and you have the rifle up in your shoulder and you're staring at the target and you're telling yourself in your head okay i've had the rifle up too long just put the rifle down yes yeah one of the hardest things to overcome is just putting the stinking rifle down yep because <laughs> Every time you're saying to yourself, saying to yourself, put the rifle down, and you don't put the rifle down, you shoot, then you wing one off in the five ring, or it's a miss on the paper. Yeah, if you know you're just... you're holding it up there too long, odds are you're going to ruin the shot because you're you're <laughs> yeah. not in the right headspace, you know. <laughs> right, right. So, so that's like a big obstacle is like actually putting the rifle down whenever you're telling yourself to do it. Yeah, uh, you know, and and I've been kind of been able to grasp that a little better recently i like that too because it 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 doesn't matter if you're shooting paper if you're shooting steel if you're shooting squirrel or a deer you know that kind of the thought process that you go through trying to increase your accuracy and your precision through you know some some target shooting like this it applies to everything and i'd bet money that if you focus on how you're shooting your your muzzle loaders when you go back into a modern rifle, even like your your carry gun, if you're the kind of guy that carries a pistol, if you if you shoot a lot with your muzzleloader, that stuff's going to carry over. You know, those fundamentals are going to be there. And if you can shoot well with a muzzleloader, you can shoot well with just about anything, I think. Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, you know, the follow-through that it takes to shoot, uh, especially a flintlock, uh, certainly carries right over into any kind of modern firearm you're going to be shooting. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the 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 techniques and the uh, mechanics that you build from, from shooting uh, something with that amount of delay really, really aids in shooting anything else better. Uh, so, you know, that's not just uh match shooting either. You know, that, that carries over into, you know, if you're just worried about hunting, 
uh, the better you are at shooting your flintlock, I mean, the better you're going to be with, with any hunting rifle. Yeah. I don't have any scientific basis for it, but I think the, <laughs> the stress of trying to shoot out the bull of a target kind of balances with, you know, taking a deer or, or shooting game, you know, you're kind of in that same mindset where you're, you're focused and you're thinking about things. There's a lot more, uh, there's a lot more weight to, you know, hunting and depending, I guess, on the level of competition you're at, but we're not getting into that, <laughs> getting into it that deep, but <laughs> there's a lot of carryover, I guess, is what I mean. Oh, there is, you know, yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, it takes, I mean, and, and, you know, to get good at anything, I mean, you can really say about anything, uh, you know, to get good at anything that if you want to be really actually proficient at it, it takes a level of dedication yeah, uh, and dis- and discipline to do it. Uh, you know, but it all depends on, uh, how deep you want to get into it. Uh, you know, there's, there's guys that I see at every shoot I go to, they go because they just enjoy shooting. They're not even really there to win anything. Yeah. They go because it's like, Hey, uh, I, I love shooting my muzzleloader. I'm just going to go out and shoot. You know, they might not be the best shot, uh, but they're there because they just enjoy doing it. And that's so, what it's all about. Know, that is, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if, if it, if it's something then you hate doing it, you know, what, what's the point in actually doing it? I think at the end of the day, the guys that you see do it a lot, you know, that are dedicated to the sport, they do it because they love doing it. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's kind of the whole point. I mean, it, uh, I mean, to, right now it's just, a, it's a, it's a hobby for me, uh, I guess. Uh, but you know what I mean? I'm kind of dedicating a lot of my free time and a lot of my non-free time uh, to the sport and the culture. Uh, you know, I mean, as you know, I mean, we're, we're, the Federation is involved in planning and running the gun makers fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so that, I mean, that's a kind of a new avenue for me. I mean, that's a lot different from, uh, just running the state shoot. Right. Uh, it's a whole other so, level for you. Oh, for sure. Uh, so, you know, you don't, not everyone has to go out and be the president of a shooting organization or plan some, uh, multifaceted gun show uh you know it it, you kind of it can be what you want it to be so what do you think the the future of muzzleloading looks like you know if we were to sit down in in 10 or 20 years and and have another conversation like this what do you think it's what do you think it's going to be like i'll tell you ethan you know if you'd asked me this question three or four years ago i'd probably been a little bit more doom and gloom about it uh you know whenever i kind of came into the sport you know, eight or nine years ago now, uh, it was looking pretty bleak. You know, you go to a shoot and you might be lucky to have 10 guys to show up to the shoot. Hmm. Uh, but within the past couple of years, you know, we've seen participation, uh, grow rapidly. Uh, the state shoot, you know, we might've had, I think five years ago, I went to the state shoot and there was like 20 people, uh, we had 20 people at this year's state shoot sign up probably within the first two hours of Friday's, uh, registration. That's awesome. Uh, so, you know, we had 52 registered shooters, which is, you know, that's not necessarily nationals level, you know, by any means, but, um, and then, you know, you go to something, like I said, you know, we're involved in the gun makers fair. Uh, so you, we go to something like that and you see, you know, that had, I think we, we count just under 3000 people came to the gun makers fair. It was so uh, busy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that kind of like, honestly, the gun makers fair really put, uh, really changed my perspective on the whole thing. Just seeing that many people who are still interested, you know, maybe they're not all interested in, uh, competitive muzzle loading, uh, but they're interested in the culture. Yeah. Uh, and that, that kind of really changed my, my way of looking at the whole situation. Uh, and, and we're in a kind of an interesting point in time. Uh, you know, we're kind of dealing with unprecedented amounts of technology. Uh, and I'm kind of hoping that as technology advances, uh, and automation advances, uh, people will kind of want to take a step back and have something and do something that's more handmade and, uh, I guess old fashioned really, which that kind of is a pretty easy way to describe our sport. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and, and as far as the living history part of it, you know, which I'm trying to get a little more involved in, uh, if you compare our access to history now compared to the way we would have had to research it, you know, 30 years ago, uh, where 30 years ago, you might have had to read five or 10 books within a couple of Google searches, we have the same information. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so and more, I think, you know, I think, yeah, yeah, for real, you know, so, um, I think even though we're getting further away from the 18th century, uh, our ability to replicate the 18th century is actually kind of getting a little easier. Yeah. Uh, in some ways. Uh, so I have, I have really high hopes for, uh, for the future. Um, you know, that's kind of another cool thing. You know, I've said multiple times now about how newcomer friendly all, all of these people are in the sport. Uh, but I've learned a lot recently too about which in, you know, and since I've been involved in the sport, uh, everyone is so happy to pass down their knowledge. Uh, you know, just specifically, uh, John DeWald, uh, who is, in my opinion, one of the, uh, one of the, the better horners, uh, alive currently. Uh, I mean, he's offered to teach me, uh, how to make horns and how to, um, engrave horns. Yeah. Uh, you know, and pro 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 probably would do it for free. Uh, you know, so it's not like these guys are harboring some kind of trade secrets. They are very forthcoming with their knowledge and they have a thirst for passing it down. Yeah. They want um, to see it continue. Absolutely. So, so there's, I don't really see a lot of hindrance in growth in the aspect of uh, lack of information. Uh, so, I mean, the, the biggest thing is getting people, you know, millennials and younger to slow down a little bit yeah. and uh, take interest. You know, you know, and a friend of mine said, Hey man, you know, you gotta, you gotta shoot muzzleloader and you load more than you do more than you shoot. I'm like, well, yeah, you could argue that I load just as much as I shoot. Uh, but you know, I'm not out there to shoot really fast, uh, or really loud. I, I'm, I shoot muzzleloader to be accurate. Yeah. And there's kind of a big difference there. So, uh, so that's kind of an obstacle. Uh, you know, we, 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 as the youth are used to getting things, you know, right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh. So that, I mean that, that's that's probably one of the biggest challenges I've found is is engaging uh, people my age and younger. It definitely it takes some work, you know. It takes some effort, and it's it's weird because you kind of have a, a, a clash of uh, of generations a little bit, and and uh, clash is a little bit more violent, I think, than it actually is. But you're kind of you're you're blending a generation that has always had immediate access to what they wanted um in in large part with a, a tradition and a culture that's you know three two three hundred years old <laughs> you know comes from yeah. a very different time and a very different era um and we're kind of finding a balance i think with that as as the like you said the machining practices and the automation kind of they bring muzzle loading forward because they make more accurate you know products and, and things available they make it more accessible because you can make them cheaper and then you also have the people getting into them because they're wanting to slow down and kind of go back in time a little bit so it's a, i think it's a really interesting cross-section it is you know and actually in, in now that you say it, one, one kind of leads the other, you know, if you can, if you can, um, get out to a shoot or out to an event with something that's factory made, if that just gets you there, that's, that's the only thing that needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would love to see someone come out and shoot against us with an inline and be like, wow, look at these guys shooting their front locks. Now I want to front lock. Yeah. You know, and, and that could be the same with, uh, you know, going out to a living history event and you kind of get the bare minimum stuff you need you know you see these guys wearing their uh, you know more authentic stuff then you ask hey how do i how do i do that uh and and like i said with everyone being so forthcoming with their knowledge 
uh, you know, it, it can be a slippery slope really once once you get into, you know, if you'd asked me 20 or 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that I would be uh, making knives or uh, carving on horns, you know, I'd be like, oh my God, <laughs> I don't think I can do that. But, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm you know, I'm not, I'm not a master by any means at right. all, you know, but, but, you know, um, you know, aspire to be better than what I am. So, uh, so that's kind of, kind of how I'm hoping, hoping to continue the culture. Yeah. Well, I think you've got a good, you got a good head on your shoulders about it and you're, you're doing some great things, I think. You know, thank you. You know, I mean, uh, you're doing, you're doing something that like, uh, you know, with the YouTube channel and the podcast, and that's like a great way to uh, appeal to, uh, you know, people our age and younger. Well, thank you. And kind of draw people into the sport, you know, and that's kind of like one thing that I'm learning is, uh, you know, the whole social media aspect of the whole thing, which, you know, it's kind of almost, uh, uh, they don't, you know, on paper, you wouldn't think that the 18th century and computers would mix well yeah <laughs> you know yeah here we are yeah they mix really well i think yeah i mean, it, I mean as it turns out yeah <laughs> but it's also good to put down your your 21st century stuff and go out into the woods and get dirty yeah you know that's Absolutely. what i look forward to every weekend <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank Jeff for coming on to the show. We'll have links to a bunch of the stuff that we were talking about in this episode in the show notes or in the description and as well as at ilovemuzzleloading.com with the blog post to go with this episode. You can visit ilovemuzzleloading.com slash podcast to see the blog posts and articles that go along with each and every podcast episode. This is going to include all the links to the stuff discussed in the episode, just like this one, as well as some photos and accompanying video if there's something that goes uh, with the episode. Longtime listeners might know that, you know, kind of the competition and, and paper punching side of muzzleloading is really where my, my family has been active for, for quite a long time. Uh, so it was really nice to kind of reconnect with that here with Jeff. And, and as I kind of continue with the channel, I'm going to be bringing some more of that stuff out and talking about it a little bit more. It's a, a real soft spot for me, really. And I, I get excited talking about it because it, it is a lot of fun and, and the people that you meet along the way are just really incredible. So I encourage you, if you're in Pennsylvania or any other state, really, please try to seek out some of these clubs that are there and, and get out with a muzzleloader and, and, and get involved. You know, you're going to meet some lifelong friends and you're going to learn a lot about how to be more accurate with your muzzleloader. And that's going to translate to a lot of other things in life. Um, it's just really a great American pastime, arguably the first American pastime, you know, shooting sports here and competitive shooting with your muzzleloaders, especially. Sorry, baseball fans, but uh, muzzleloading was here first. So uh, get out and get active and, and get involved with this. Um, you know, as much as I enjoy seeing people and talking with people online uh, about muzzleloading, I think uh, it's good for all of us to, to put our devices down and get out there and, and kind of put all this into practice and, and get involved and get active. So I hope you can do that. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, if you have any questions about this or anything else related to muzzleloading, you can shoot me an email at ilovemuzzleloading at gmail.com or search kind of the archive that we're building at ilovemuzzleloading.com. It's going to have a, as many resources there as I can for you to check out. And uh, if there's not something there, odds are I know somebody who can uh, point you in the right direction and I'm happy to connect you with those people. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>